with our final speaker for this session, Dr. Maoz Kahana, the senior lecturer in the Jewish History Department, Tel Aviv University. He studied in various yeshivot and received his PhD from Hebrew University of Jerusalem in, in 2010. Has been a visiting fellow in the Tikva Center of the Jewish Law and Civilization at New York University and Solyon Mandel Fellow at the Hebrew University. His first book is forthcoming from Zaman Shazal Publication House, and he is currently researching a second book, Moderating a Modernity, sorry, and Nomos Jewish Law in its historical context, and I believe it will be also part of our uh, lecture. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning, Chodesh Tov for everyone. Uh, this is Rosh Chodesh Adam. And um, actually, I'm a little out of the Chabad, uh, Chabadic universe to the Hasidut, <laughs> which sometimes seems the same, sometimes different. Uh, actually, Shulchan Aruch Admor Azakem is born for a discussion about. about uh, its own discussion about Alecha uh, and Hasidut. And this uh, discussion might be a kind of introduction, maybe a more general introduction for the subject of Alecha and Hasidut and its, um, its optional uh, horizons for, re for research. Um, so, let's start. The Odenti Pikulski, a Benedictine priest, was one of the Frank Frankist confessors during the mass conversion to Christianity in 1759. Soon after this event, in the year 1760, Pikulski published a historical account about the Frankists, or the Contra Talmudists, as he named them. Surprisingly enough, surprisingly enough, in his opinion, Frankism was not an 18th century phenomenon, nor it was a Jewish heretical sect. Instead, he claims Frankism to be a strand of the real, pure, ancient Jewish secret theology, which was confronted and suppressed by the Jewish rabbis for thousands of years throughout history, as he noted. Today's contra talmudists exist existed in Israel even before the birth of Christ, through they were called by different names according to their time. At the beginning, they were called the Kabbalists because they explained the Holy Scripture mythically through the, the teachings of Kabbalah. They were good and understood the mysteries of the Old Testament without any error, to say in a complete accordance with Christian teachings, of course, for Pikulski's point of view. Later, when the sages of Jerusalem synagogue started to favor the, the Talmuds, plural, traditions and laws above the divine law, which misleads the Jewish masses. The Kabbalists opposed them, and they came to be called the contra Talmudists. As Pavel Macheko clearly proved, Pikulski's distinction between those two contradictory Jewish strands was not novel. Pikulski friend the Frankist affair within a well-known uh, late medieval Hebraist pattern, as was outlined in different variations in Raymond Martinis and John and, and Dion Rochlin's influential works and many who followed their footsteps. This theme claimed to separate between the secret, mythical, and mystical Jewish original tradition to the vulgar Talmudic legal one. The, this separation could play an important role in establishing and justifying an intellectual strand like the Christian Kabbalah, of course, as recovering the true essential Christian truth which were preserved in this theosophical school. It would also provide, as we see, a framework for how to conduct a social, intellectual, and political affair like the Frankist, like the Frankist dispute between the Nomian um, rabbinic community, the Talmudistan, versus the Zaharistan, the contra-Talmudists. But our current topic, 
research of Hasidism might bring us to an additional field application of this Hebraic theme, as was placed in the core of academic modern research of Judaism, Wissenschaft der Juden. Stefan Brunet, in his 1996, uh, 1996 book named From Christian Hebraism to Jewish Studies, uh, Johannes Buxdorf and Hebrew Learning in the 17th Century, pointed out the historical centrality of Christian Hebraism in the establishment of Jewish studies as an academic field. Our discussion will explore, explore one later intellectual dimension of this claim, and will look for the intellectual opportunities and methodical horizons which can be opened by questioning this veteran yet influential uh, binary structure in the specific context of the academic research of Hasidism. Gershom Shalom, founder of, the, of, of uh, modern Kabbalah research, devoted one of his famous 1938 uh, lectures, which were assembled to the book Magic Trends, to Hasidism. Sholem depicted 18th century Hasidism as a renewal of the mythical strengths of Judaism. The relationship, the relationship between the myth, secret, and mystic tendencies, as opposed to normative law, is in a fundamental contrast. Each is promoted by the fall of the other. Consequently, Sholem argued that the rise of Hasidism, of Hasidism presented a basic situation in which the secret was embedded into the personality which gave it a new intensity, argued Scholem. Consequently, using the binary model, argued Scholem, Hasidism and Orthodox Jewry faced a life and death struggle. The most surprising fact in this affair, added Scholem, is that the clash between them did not reach these critical dimensions. Yet this surprising fact does not remain so if we abandon some of Scholem's prior assumptions concerned, concerning the essential relationship between mysticism, myth, and law, or if we conduct a close inquiry in regards to the specific context of, Hasidic, of the Hasidic movement. An, inst an instigation uh, of this kind might highlight the simple fact that many of these revolutionary, revolutionary figures were not only ecstatic spiritual leaders, but at the same time, an integral, an integral part of the old regime. Official and normative community rabbis, legal writers, halachic decisions, and compilers of responsa, who headed Jewish courts. Rabbi Levi Yitzchak eh, of Pinsk and Berdichev, Rabbi Avram Yoshua of Akta and Yassi, Rabbi Shmelke Horvitz, who headed the courts of Ritual Shinova and Nikolschburg, as, as well as Rabbi, Is Rabbi Israel of Kolnitz, uh, who was not a, a, an official rabbi but a Magid, but left us uh, official responsa. Um, and dozens of similar Hasidic leaders who, left, um, who all left us massive documentation regarding uh, with their legal activity. Delving into those rich materials, we might rethink the basic relations between law and the divine. Nomos and Eros, Hasidic mysticism and legal jurisprudence. In this regard, we might recall the original character of Nomos, Greek, uh, Greek divinity, who masters human law in, in ancient Greece, an Olympic divine deity who is the father of the goddess Dike, identified with justice. But at the same time, and not less important, the husband of Eusebia, the deity, uh, the deity, the deity of piety, Hasidut. So what can we learn about the specific encounter between Hasidic spiritualists and the law? Offering a complex net of historical and, concept and conceptual cross-junctions instead of stark contrast, um, we should not abandon the potential tensions in the fusion between legal traditions, mystical inclinations, and social organization. In this, in this context, we might ask, does a distinct Hasidic halacha really exist? And if so, what exactly does it mean? I wish to present you today three distinguished and even contradictory answers to this very question. Each one of these three frameworks 
has a rhetorical, sometimes, sorry, a theoretical, and sometimes even theological background. Each has significant documented legal materialization, and each, of course, sparked its own public conflict. So, let's begin. The first pr framework which I will present is one of continuity, centered on the beloved ethos of contemporary Lurianic Kabbalah. The process of ritualization of Lurianic Kabbalah as it moves from, from an, an esoteric Kabbalistic ethos to one diver diverse halachic practices was a central feature of European Jewry in the 17th and 18th century. Faced with the Mignactic claims regarding the reaching of offenses and violation of traditional customs, the, Hasidi, the Hasidim grasped hold of this Lurianic precedent, through which they tried to present their, their community as an additional stage of this process. In this light, Veshti and Hasidism is presented as a halachic ideology, ideology of internal, internalization, in which Lurianic literature should be merged within particular European Ashkenazi communities. Individual Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi pietistic customs should be transformed here into a collective communal ethos. Apologetic declarations of such kind were already voiced in the first years of the conflict following the 1772 bans against Hasidism and on. A marvelous example from this kind is Rabbi Shmerkel from Linkerspur's polemic declaration, where he clearly argued against the traditional mode of Lurianic customs as restrained within elite pietistic circles. Rabbi Shmerkel wrote, the color of the Lassot at Smo, Talmid Chacham Ose, Umir Dea Laloch Neged Achaim, Lassot Tchumin Lemala, Lechalek, Ben Mefusam, Lishenom Mefusam, Ben Nar Lezaken. And here comes one of the finest uh, Hebrew literature sentences, to my view. Kavo Hashem Lenishbarei Lev, Vedakei Ruach Yoshia, Belo Plug. That's a poetry. Yeah, everyone wants to make himself a Talmud Chacham can do so, or who knows it to justify between different people, creating boundaries above, separating between a famous scholar and someone unknown. Yet an elder, God is close to the broken-hearted and will deliver those of a person uh, oppressed spirit without distinction. Interest, internet, uh, internet, inter, interesting, however, it seems that in subsequent generations, this apology became an authentic part of Hasidic self-conscience. As an initial revolutionary spirit settled into a far more conciliated, closed and traditional movement. In this model of Hasidism, we find synthesis of halakha and, and the conceptual universe of, Lurian, of Lurianic culture. The usual rhetorical term for this merging is a Hasidic khumba. Yeah, like you can see already read in the first paragraph in the handout I, I gave. But this word does not incorporate its many and varied tensions <coughs> with the extent of, culture, of the cultural changes that follow this kind of process of internalization, which remains incomplete, highly, highly disturbing, but often very fruitful. The internalization of knowledge from the outside of the pure legal discourse is, in my view, an enduring characteristic of Ashkenazi al and one of its sources of power. Talmudic demons, Ashkenazic customs, medieval magic, like Brayta Din Da, Sabbat of Yudah Hasid, and so on, Zoharic literature, and then the Lurianic rituals, were integrated throughout the ages, the ages into the all-encompassing world of al -Akha. In this sense, Hasidic al can indeed be seen as a unique development within Ashkenazi al -Akha. Additional stage in its long-term complicated relations with extra-legal knowledge. Both the vitality of this framework and its weaknesses can be de demonstrated through looking at, at the storming discourse between the Hasidic leader, Rabbi Moshe, Rabbi Moshe Teitelbaum, head of the Jewish court in Chateau Oily, northeast of Hungary, 
And the well-known Rabbi Moshe Sofer, the Khatam Sofer. Uh, the hands up, number uh, one, two. Based in Khatam Sofer, based in Presto. Rabbi Teitelbaum defended the widespread alachic observance of various Kabbalistic practices that had once been the prerogative of the elite alone, arguing that, that the Hasidic communities embody, embody and are indeed alachically founded upon a strict obligation to the ethos of Lurianic culture. Okay, like you can read, I won't read the whole passage, but said, Nusach Ha'ari, Shehu Nusach Shalem Itnagim, Shekola Mitvalalim Benusach Zeh, Ki Imu Bikiblu Alem. It's a common obligation, which, which is centered upon, which actually, which distinct Hasidic community from any other community in, in, in this, in, in this uh, context. The Khatam Sofer's alternative model, number two, source number two, was extremely surprising. In his opinion, Hasidism truly fulfills an essential need of any religious life, as it prevents religious action from the dumbness of routine, mitzvah, and shimon of the But it is precisely this God, the expression of the individual's love for God, that can't, tra that can't transfer over to a mass movement. Movement, the source number two, I will read. V'achlasot edah shlema, kulam itchasdu b'minhag echad lekulam. אם כן, היא גופי נעשה חוק לישראל ומצוות אנשים מלומדה, וזה אי אפשר. שהרי אין לב שני בני אדם שווה באהבת השם. ה-translate,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,but,
גביית עדות, אופישיאל גביית עדות, might be really a biased forgery, but both neutral documentation, as well as internal Hasidic traditions, depict very similar occurrences. The response literature documents the use of divine spirit to permit a woman whose husband's whereabouts, Aguna, Agunot, actually, um, and also in regards to a woman suspected in prostitution, Znut. Uh, these cases, at least three different cases, documented uh, cases, were conducted by the Maggid of Kuznitz, this is history, <laughs> by the Maggid of Kuznitz around 1798, the Jose from Lublin in the same period, and Rabbi Yitzchak from Kalov in 1840. One would assume that the internalization of this kind of anarchic tendency within the, within the Arachic system would be limited to the first few generations of the Hasidic movement. But the picture is much more nuanced and interesting than this. The tradition of the of Shibcha Bet, for example, example number four, describes the best as eating in public an animal considered treifa by the slaughter, by claiming that the beast itself wants him to eat it. Yeah, like you can read. אבל הבהמה הזו מבקשת ממני שיכול ממנה. A lack of documentation from the late 19th century, number five, describes a beast apprised in the same way by the, by the Hasidic tzaddik Rabbi Yoshua of Bells, who ordered Rabbi Shalom Fedron, the Maharshan, the greatest Galician uh, 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 posek of the time, to write a response on justifying this ruling. This is number five in the sources. This odd response was indeed written, but, but was subsequently hidden under the pretext, the pretext that this incredible ruling was only issued in regards to that specific case. The ideology described in Shibcha Bejt, whether historically correct or not, became a reality in the hands of the Belzer Rabbi. Whereas the best, as it portrayed in the hagiography, has no need of legal confirm, confirm, uh, confirmation by an educator, the Belze Rabbi, less secure of his mystical powers and or much more bound in social reality of late 19th century Hasidism, participated in a formulation of an apparently official and archi decree, provide support for his heavenly decisions. These interesting amalgamations of the divine spirit and alachic legal formulas are indicative of a further characteristic of the same period. By the midway point of the 19th century, it seems that parts of the Hasidic movement has in, had indeed become more stable, institutionalized, and perhaps even somewhat orthodox. In this regard, the legal issue is of essential importance. To my claim, this kind of legalization does not necessarily eliminate the, char the, char the charismatic foundations of the Hasidic tradition, as is usually assumed, but in the reverse, as I try to show. Like when the divine spirit becomes, uh, is being rooted in alachic, into alachic mechanisms. The double commitment of the late 19th century Hasidic halacha and also the early 20, like, uh, um, uh, like Levy showed about uh, Munkach, um, towards both the structures of normative legal discourse and Hasidic traditions, often produces multifaceted structures of meaning regarding the fundamental relations between halacha and revelation. Can, can we rely the divine spirit in a situation of a dubbed, suffix? Can one do so in regards to a rabbinical profession, Rabbanan, or an act of piety, Midat Hasidut, or in a life treating situation, in Pikuach Nefesh, I'm a child in Smokal, Ucha Kodesh, we call myself Rabbanan, the Waita, Pikuach Nefesh, Safek. Can every institution be considered as a work institute of the divine spirit? These difficult legal discussions of the 90s and 20th centuries sought to render charisma, a charismatic <coughs> experience into stable halachi. Formulas. Of course, this fusion of values, Hasidic ethos, and legal ruling was also subject 
to observations and conflict. In 1836, a member of the Zlotchel Rabbinical Court allowed the family relative of, of a dangerously sick man to drive a horse wagon on Shabbat to the telegraph station outside the Shabbos domain in order, in order to send a quittal, a request for immediate prayer by telegraph to the Belzer Rabbi, Koach Nefesh, like we just said. Rabbi Shlomo Kluger from Brody, a standard Ashkenazi decision, was shocked by this ruling and demanded the removal of this court member from, from his post. On the other hand, many contributors to the ensuing, ensuing stormy discussions concerning this event, which in certain places became a daily anachic custom, looked upon a heavenly healing as a legitimate component of the laws of saving life. In this view, the desecration the, the decoration of the Shabbat, in this case, is a mitzvah. This appeal to the divine spirit injected an absolute and unambitious element into Allahic scholasticism, usually full of doubts and uncertainties. However, a field model of a Hasidic halakha actually worked in the opposite direction. Several teachings of Rabbi Dov Be'er Amagid of Mezrich deal with the relationship between the one Torah, supreme and divine, and the diverse nature of its human realiz realizations. This tension deeply rooted in the literature of, of Chazal, of the sages, that dealt with the written and oral Torahs, was further enrich, enriched in this context. Through the inspiration of the figure of the Hasidic Tzaddik, both the scholastic Tana and the Alachic the Caesar received a measure of Kabbalistic spiritualistic influence. For example, Bet Hillel and Bet Shammai are identified in the Magid's um, with grace and strength, chesed and uh, respectively. These spiritual attributes are cited as the reason for the every halachic decision. Everyone, Bet Hillel or Bet Shammai, follows his own character, his particular emotional spiritual tendency. The halachic decision in this view is actually a Kabbalistic expression, amshacha, of a, of a certain spiritual power, which depends on the desires of the tzaddik, the scholar. Grace indicates leanness. Strength symbolizes prohibition. Beauty equals complexity, etc. The tzaddik, which is actually every regular halachic scholar, changes the tzaruf, the combination, the spiritual nature of the object, thus determining its status as permitted or prohibited. This creative power is given to the hands of the scholars to transform the expressions leshanot et amshachot, however they desire it. They desire leshanot et amshachot kirtzonam. Elsewhere, this is source number six. The market explains that disputes between the sages are actually a matter of aesthetics alone. For since the old horizon is entirely a bridal uh, ornamentation, okay, of the Shekhinah, each sage, each sage attempts to fashion an appropriate ornament in his eyes. Yeah, like he says, Kach tzarif liot akishut, and other scholars say, Kach tzarif liot akishut. Yeah, this is, this, this is the basic situation of halachic discourse of Alachic Machloket by, by the Megid Mezrich in this passage. Um, each sage attempts to fashion an appropriate ornament in his eyes. These approaches serve no objective purpose, but are played with and enjoyed by God. This subjective sp spiritualization of Alachic Rian is further de developed by the Magid of Mezrich many students, who pose the following, the following almost, almost banal question. If the legitimacy of each halachic opinion derives from the depths of the soul of the sage and his particular aesthetic bent, what justification is there for determining halachic decision according to one opinion rather than another? A great variety of answers were suggested. Either the halacha is determined is in accordance with the souls of the old generation, like source number seven, Mushat Levi. Or in accordance 
with the wishes of the tzaddik of the generation, or even in accordance with a divine uh, prefend, uh, pre prefend that is itself subject to constant change, as it deals with the world with a different attribute in each and every period. Yeah? Like a uh, this shift is directly mirrored in the halacha. Of course, this Hasidic formulation uh, instigated a great polemical debate. 1832 saw the publication of pre kodesh Ilulim of Rabbi Svirsh from Zidichov, a student of the Jose. In one of his sermons, he claims that, as it is well known, the halacha changes according to time and place. He bases his claim on the, of perpetual change on the words of the Ari on the one hand, on the statements of scholars of astronomy on the other, since perpetual change exists both in the heavenly realms, as taught by the Ari, in the astronomical spheres, as the same is true of the divine will regarding Allah's decisions. In this manner, the Hasidic master sought to explain the teaching of the, sage, of the sages that one should be shone alachot b'chol yom. Learn, shone alachot b'chol yom, that halachot in fact change, shone, meshane, over time. Only seven years later, Rabbi Shmuel Yudha Rappaport, a Galician rabbi in Maskil, cites this passage at left in a right written to a head of court in, the German, in a German community. Rabbi Rappaport used this Hasidic exposition as an example of the potential ruin of the Torah at the hands of the radical enlightenment. According to him, the later Maskilic viewpoint follows the anarchic path that the Hasidic precedent, as its ideological relativism will lead to the abol abol abolition of halakha in practice. He identifies, that, uh, he, he identifies dangerously heretical element in the aforementioned Hasidic exposition, a quote, which is very close to the views of Spinoza, as he puts it. Is Rabbi Rappaport correct in, correct in his anti-Spinozian critique? Did this Hasidic ideology have, have practical and systematic ramifications? In certain dimensions, I think the answer might be, is this, is this, is, is this it might be the case, as traces of subjective halachic rulings based on the inner soul are recorded in, in Hasidic writings. The most prominent example in this regard, the one I won't discuss, discuss it today, is a nephew and student of the aforementioned Rabbi Svi Hirsch, Rabbi Yitzchak Isaac of Komarno, whose Haydn, Halachic Treatise, Shulchan Atahor, it was never permitted to be published, um, it was a manuscript, um, is in effect an alternative Shulchan Aruch, detailed and, and systematic. One, one model of, from this phenomena is, is Psikar Kishor Shem Shema to determine by the, uh, by the inner soul. To conclude, to conclude, Rabbi Shneur Zalman of Yadi, Hasidic rabbi, and the author of the Halachic Magnum Opus, Shulchan Aruch Arab, uh, offers a finally nuanced description of the relationship between Nomos and Eros, and this is the, la the last, the last uh, source, number eight. Uh, all the commandments are expression of the, of, of the one divine will, Ratzon. But each of them embodies a different quality of divine pleasure, Ta'anut Prati. It is precisely through the great variety and intensity of the nomos that the eros finds its fullest expression. In this paper, I tried to offer an, an, an alternative pres perspective regarding the interface between law mythicism and social reality. The inner devotion, a data from it, might be said, that truly characterized Hasidism did not walk through the binary model defined by the Christian Hebraists and academic scholars. Instead, I have suggested that in the specific context of Hasidism, nomos and eros, nomos, eros, and piety often merge together in unique and powerful ways, presenting a novel halachic discourse. The three models outlined above, communal internalization of Lurianic cultures, legal mystification of the divine spirit, and the subjective aesthetics of, of Allahic rulings, offer us 
a point of departure for delving into the legal heritage of the Hasidic phenomenon. In arguing against, against Mikulski's analysis of the events in 1760, pitting the Talmudists against, against the Zorists, we might invoke his contemporary Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov. It's the same years. Um, while facing the same events, the Frankist conversion, the Baal Shem Tov seems to express a completely different attitude. The tradition found in Shibcha Baal Shem Tov regarding Srifat Talmud, the burning of the Talmud, in the eve of the first uh, dispute in Kamenitz Podolsk, and Abba Hashem Tov, um, it cites him as mourning the burning of the Talmud and shouting, how can we survive the exile even one day without oral Torah? A few yom echad. This lament is mirrored in the reverse when the Baal Shem Tov is portrayed as crying in a national passage that a limb has been taken away from the body of the Jewish people when the Frankists converted en masse, Christianity. These traditions of Baal Shem Tov can be seen as offering a framework for the academic study of Hasidism, one in which Jewish spiritualists should be kept as an organic part of Jewish culture, along with an equally necessary oral, to oral Torah. Eros blends with, blends with and is expressed by the seemingly rigid norms of the Talmudic tradition. Thank you.